Welcome to another episode with Excellence Tuition Center. Today I'm going to be revising Section D of Combined Science Specimen Paper 2. The first question reads, state Newton's first law of motion. So I had already written the answer which says, every object continues in its state of motion unless acted upon by an external force. So this is Newton's first law of motion which basically means that if an object was not moving, that is a stationary object, it will remain stationary or at rest unless there is a force which causes it to start moving, that is the external force. And um, if it was moving, it will continue to move unless there is an external force which causes the moving object to stop. So in most cases, an object which is moving we will stop just because in reality most objects they encounter a force of friction newton's first law also brings about the idea of inertia so what is inertia inertia is the resistance of objects to change their state of motion so it is the reluctance to start moving if it was stop if it was stationary or to stop moving if it was already in motion. So um, inertia also is related to mass. Mass can also be defined as the amount of inertia that, or as a measure of inertia of an object. So the larger the mass, the higher the inertia. Item two, explain why a block, a book side sliding and experiencing a frictional force of nine newtons keeps on sliding across a desk so the answer is the force causing it to move is greater than the nine newton frictional force so what happens is that uh, we have what we call a resultant force so the resultant force is the one which remains after we have algebraically added the force which are acting on the object. So for example, if there is a force of 20 newtons which is acting on the object and our um, frictional force is 9 newtons, it means that we are going to subtract 9 from 20. So we are going to remain with 11 newtons which is the resultant force which will cause the book to continue to slide although it is experiencing a frictional force. So it is just because the resultant, uh, the force which is causing it to move is greater than the 9 newton frictional force. So we remain with the resultant force which will keep the object in motion. Part B, it reads, a block of mass 2 kg is accelerated by a force of 9 newtons. Calculate the acceleration. So here the formula that we are going to use is the formula force is equal to mass times acceleration so here what you want to calculate is the acceleration so you can just substitute the given values 2 kg kg is the unit for measuring mass so this 2 kg or this quantity this is the mass and then this is our force so here f is standing for force so 4 is equal to the mass that is 2 kg so it's 2 multiplied by a so we are going to have 4 is equal to 2a so in order to get a which is the acceleration we are just going to divide both sides by 2 by 2 so this cancels here so 4 divided by 2 we are going to have our acceleration being equal to 2 meters per second squared so also you have to put units it is very important to put units so that you can acquire all the three marks. Part C, item one, it reads, state three events which occur in the power stroke of the petrol engine. So the answer is, the spark from the spark plug explodes the petrol air, air gas mixture. Petrol from expanding gas pushes piston down and movement of piston rotates flywheel connected to crankshaft 
So what just happens, just because for a petrol engine, we have a spark plug. So when there's a spark from that spark plug, because our petrol is a highly inflammable um, substance, it quickly what ignites. And when it has ignited, it starts to expand because there is burning and there is production of other volume of other gases, which increase um, the pressure. So the, there is expansion due to an increased pressure, and that expansion pushes the piston down. So the piston which moves down, it causes the rotation of the flywheel, which is connected to the crankshaft. Item two, it reads. State one advantage of modern petrol engines over the old petrol engines. So, some of the advantages is that they are more efficient. They are more efficient and also they have higher power outputs. They have higher power outputs. So, yeah, in terms of efficiency, we are talking about combustion so they can um, facilitate an almost complete combustion so it, them being more efficient they cause less pollution they cause less pollution so the efficiency is in terms of causing less pollution and the higher power outputs is in terms of uh, giving more power as compared to the fuel input. Question 14a, it reads, define the term telecommunications. So the term telecommunications can be defined by saying, this is sending and receiving of information of information over a distance so that is the definition we can use for telecommunication so it's just the sending and receiving of information over a distance we need to say there is a sender and there is a channel which is the medium over which the information is being carried on and on the other hand, there is a receiver which is going to receive the information that has been transmitted over the channel. Part B says, give two examples of telecommunication systems. So other examples, I'm just going to give more than two. So we have email, we also have cell phones, we also have TV. So we have TV, that is television, and we have the radio. So these are some of the examples of telecommunication systems. So it's just systems that we can use for communication purposes. Part C, the question reads, figure 14.1 shows the components of a communication system. So this is A, then this is B, and then this is C. And the question reads, name components A and C. So component A, this is the first part of the communication system and information is conveyed to the medium and later to component C. So what it just means here is that component A, you can say this is the sender. So this is the sender of the information or you can even say the transmitter. So this is the sender or transmitter. And component C, this is the receiver. So component C, this is the receiver. So that is components A and B. Just because we start off with the sender or transmitter, which converts analog signals into digital, and then they are converted by the channel or the medium and it reaches the receiver which decodes the encoded information by the sender or transmitter and it conveys from digital back to analog which can be heard by the receiver for example if it is over a phone call 
when someone gives the analog signal by speaking into the microphone of the of the um, cell phone it is converted to a digital signal and then conveyed by the medium and it reaches the what the receiver and when it reaches the receiver there's decoding of that electronic or digital signal back to analog signal into voices which can be heard so basically that is how a communication system works part item two it reads describe the functions of component a so component a that is the receiver so the functions of component a is that it allows input of signals allows input of signals and also it facilitates the conversion of of analog of analog to digital uh, of analog signals to digital signals and transmission to medium and transmission to medium so these are the functions of component a describe two advantages of a cell phone over a landline so it is portable it is portable means you say you can carry it around and it is it is a multi-purpose gadget so it is multi-purpose and it can also allow the taking of pictures so since this is a described question you have to write it is portable meaning it can be carried around in the pocket or in a bag and it is multi-purpose because it can um, said text messages it can be used for social media platforms such as whatsapp facebook sending of pictures and so forth so a described question need to add more information you, you may not necessarily state like this so you need to add more information question 15 it reads figure 15.1 shows the energy conversion in a thermal power station so this is the primary source of energy then to the furnace to a to the boiler potential energy stage three steam turbine and we have kinetic energy a transformer stage four and electrical energy item one name a possible primary source of energy in zimbabwe so for a thermal power station, a possible primary source of energy in Zimbabwe is coal. That is a possible primary source of energy. Item two reads, state two disadvantages of the energy source named in item one. So the disadvantages of using coal as a source of energy is that it is non-renewable. It is non-renewable. You say if you have used it, it is um, you can no, no longer use it again, and we also have pollution. It also causes pollution. There is also the greenhouse effect. The greenhouse effect. So the greenhouse effect is caused by carbon dioxide, which is emitted. Because combustion of coal, it is mainly a carbon containing fuel. So the combustion of that coal, it results in the emission of carbon dioxide, which is a greenhouse gas. So it um, results or it facilitates the greenhouse effect, the causing of the greenhouse effect, which is uh, generally the rise of the um, rising of temperatures, which leads to global warming. And there's also production of acid rain. There's production of acid rain. So since here it was required to give two disadvantages, you can just say it is non-renewable and causes pollution.
Item 3, it reads, give the form of energy represented by A. So, A, that is the, um, this is this part from the furnace, and we have A to the boiler. So, here we can just say the form of energy represented by A is heat. So, that is heat energy, which is represented by A. So the next question, it reads, describe what happens at stages three and four. So at stage three, the gravitational potential energy from the steam, it turns the turbines, gaining kinetic energy. And at stage four, so this explanation is based to on the diagram that we have. At stage four, the kinetic energy is converted to electrical energy by the generator principle however um, the generator is connected in, is uh, found in the turbine so when the turbine rotates that kinetic energy which is coming from the gravitational potential energy from the steam is used to generate electricity by the rotation of the turbine which is kinetic energy which is then converted to electrical energy part b it reads state the energy conversion in a hydroelectric power station so the energy conversion in a hydroelectric power station is from gravitational potential energy to electrical energy so the gravitational potential energy it comes from the water which is held at a height for example on a dam the water is let out from a certain height so um, from a certain height the water will possess gravitational potential energy which can be calculated from the formula gravitational potential energy is equals to mass times acceleration due to gravity times the height or depth and that gravitational potential energy is converted to kinetic energy. So for the hydroelectric power production, there's also the turbines, which convert the electrical, the kinetic energy from, which is converted from the gravitational potential energy to electrical energy. So finally, we have electrical energy from gravitational potential energy. So, ladies and gentlemen, we've reached the end of our revision. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe, and stay tuned for more.